This is Tiny Epic Game of... I'm not going to sing anymore. We are here to tell you about and give you a preview of Tiny Epic Game of Thrones. This is the first yeah. IP game yeah. in the Tiny Epic series. Um, we'll see if there's going to be more IP that they I do. Know, but this is a good... This was a good pick because I yeah. will say out of all of the Tiny Epic games, this is probably what I would call the most epic in that they have, as you can see here, kind of replicated a lot of what you'd see in Game of Thrones. In fact, the entire map of Westeros is right here, made up with these cards. You've got these cards, the house cards, of course, you've got all the major houses represented. You've even got, you know, they're not miniatures, but you've got these little wooden meeples that represent your armies and castles. So they managed to cram a lot into this box uh, and replicate the Game of Thrones experience in the way that they do, which is yes. to kind of abstract some things, streamline some things, uh, and deliver a game that is suitable to their audience, but also giving that the, the betrayals and the alliances and the, the battles and all the stuff that you'd come to expect with Game of Thrones. And, and it does just that. I think it's going to give you, it's going to pay off on a lot of those things in a very streamlined nature, like yeah. Ryan said. Um, the footprint, I don't know if this may be, it's not big. No, it's not the biggest It's either. not big. It's a medium. But so it's, I've seen smaller, I've seen bigger. Uh, in the Tiny Epic in series. In Tiny Epic series. But like we said, it covers everything. You've got the map here. We've also got our house boards. And then you're going to see up across the top some other houses. These are the ones that we're not using. In any player count, you're going to use three of those plus House Aaron yeah. to be sort of the non-controlled houses in the game, which is kind of interesting because it gives a similar experience at two-player and four-player. There are some differences for sure, but it's going to rely on a lot of those non-player houses. Yeah, and each one of these houses comes with the same things. Uh, and like David said, we just chose two, and these are actually double-sided. So the ones that you're using flip to the player side, and the ones you're not using flip to the NPC side. The only house that can't be used is House Aaron. They're always kind of an NPC. If you know the yeah. story of Game of Thrones, that kind of makes sense. But every one of these houses comes with your, your miniature that represents your, your hero, your leader. You've got all those wooden meeples I talked about, and you've got a unique character card. Now, there are no unique uh, like sets of cards or decks for your house. No. Everyone's drawing cards from their common pool, but you do have this one unique character, and each one of these houses has their own unique ability and some slightly unique objectives that they're trying to complete over the course of the game as well. Yeah, that hero card is going to be in your hand along with four plot cards at the beginning. The plot cards, which we'll get to momentarily, are multi-use cards, which is a fairly significant element of this game. But that hero card's going to go into your hand. The hero cards from these NPCs, once you ally, might also go into your hand. Yeah. And all of the houses are represented at the beginning of the game. Here's Ryan here in Castle Rock. I'm the Baratheons over here. And then the NPCs have some presence in their respective territories as well. Yeah, and you're going to notice, again, on this map, it is made up of these six different cards, but each one of these cards is split into different areas. Some of these areas have castles. Some of these areas have little coin symbols. And, of course, some of these areas have troops. And then King's Landing here has the Iron Throne. This is what Game of Thrones is all about trying to control that Iron Throne. But most of the things you're trying to do in the game, a lot of the objectives are tied into moving around this map. There's only six rounds in the game, and it, they play pretty quick. Very th quick. Through that six rounds, and you're scoring three times. So really, this game is all about positioning your units and taking control of areas in order to hit these three different scorings. Of course, everything you're doing in the game is to effectively get points during those scoring phases. But after the sixth round the game is just over so you play those rounds using a, a little bit of a like dice drafting yes. mechanic and then see who scores the most points at the end yeah although tiny epic has come close to troops on a map type games in the past this one i think yeah. truly is a troops on the map sort of game and like ryan said it revolves and is driven by these dice the active player the hand of the king is going to roll up these dice and then the player to the right, and depending on player count, it's gonna go counterclockwise around the board, is gonna take one of those dice, that's the dice they're gonna ultimately use on their turn. Yep. And then in a two-player game, and in a three-player game, but in a two-player game for sure, they're gonna take another die and sort of like put it up there. We're all gonna be able to use that eventually. Yep. Then the dice are going to eventually get back to me. In a two-player game, I'll get them immediately. And then I too choose one of these to be left over. I'm gonna choose this one, and then I have these two dice left to begin the game and start my turn. On your turn, you're going to use one of the two dice that you have in front of you in one of these spaces. Now this is kind of interesting. I am the active player for this turn. If I chose this action right here, 
I get to take this optional action myself, then I take the action on the die, and then everyone else in clockwise order is going to also take just the action on the die, not the one on this space. So what this does is effectively give everyone on their turn the chance, and this die is gonna to go to the next player, to choose one of two die, place it out here, but as you go further and further, some of these actions are going to already have been taken. Yeah. So it's an interesting action and follow mechanism that gives players, even in a two-player game, a lot of opportunity to take several different actions on your turn, and the houses can have some impact on that too. Yeah, you'll notice as people draft dice, like David said, you're drafting in reverse turn order. So you are getting to see the actions you're going to take because you're following. You kind of have your eye on what everyone else is going to do. You might be in a situation though where you want to take an action that you don't have access to on the dice. Your house has a power that just lets you change any die to any side that matches your house power. For example, House Lannister, I can just change a die to this event symbol, which is the Iron Throne, yeah. and I can choose to use that die instead. As you expand out, as you gain these alliances, each one of these houses has a power to change a die to a different face. So as you're doing that, you can choose your alliances based not only on their position on the board, but also what their power is, because you might want to be taking that action more often, and that effectively guarantees that you'll be able to do that action. Yeah, so like we said, all of the actions on the die and on this mat are what the game revolves around. So we're going to give you not a complete how to play, yeah. but we're going to go through and give you an idea of what each of those do because they're going to do all the kinds of things that you would expect in a Troops on the Map game, but with some specifics that I think are unique to this system. The first one is Recruit. This is how you're going to get more troops out there. Your troops, or power tokens they're called, can come from your mat or, if you're allied with someone, from their mat. You're going to be able to put those out into areas that you control paying gold. The gold is going to depend on how many troops you've taken. You can see across your player mat, they get more and more expensive. Troops or power tokens from allied forces will always only cost one. And then, of course, your heroes are going to cost a little bit more. Your hero is going to cost three, and an allied troops hero is going to cost two to get out on the map. And when you put one of their uh, heroes out, you'll get their hero card into your hand as well. Yeah, you're going to have to recruit to do any really of the other actions uh, on the, on For the sure. board. This is a game where you're going to be committing troops to battle and losing troops quite often. Another cool thing about that, the more troops you place, the higher your income is. The more troops you have on the board, the more you're getting every turn. And every time you lose a troop, you get a little bit of a compensation. When they come back to your board, you get that income immediately when they come back as well. So. Don't be afraid to risk it because the other actions you're going to do all require you to move around the board in different yeah. ways. And really, you're doing that in two different ways. There's just like a basic march, and then there's a sail. And those are kind of as they sound. March lets you move from territory to territory on the land, and sail lets you move kind of outside the outer edge of the board through the water. Although they do work a little bit differently based on which one you're doing. Yeah, when you march, you're going to move up to two domains by land. And when you do this, you can't move from multiple places. You're going to start in one domain and take as many of the troops as you want from the troops you have there and move them as what they call an army. That can be any number of troops that you have there. And as you move them, you can pick up other troops along the way of yours or an allies, or you can drop off Moncala style, if you will, into the territories you're moving through. The other one is to sail. Sail works quite a bit differently. Sailing is going to go around, effectively, if you think about it, it's around the outside edge of the board. Now, note that the wall is up here, so you can't move across the top of the board, but you have to move one or two cards. So you can take this to move from any domain, because all the domains yeah. touch the water. I could move from this card to either here or here in any of the domains. I could move from this card to here or here or here or here. I just couldn't go from here to here because it's more than two cards away. Yeah, and there's, a, of course, a lot of different reasons why you're wanting to move to some of these different areas. One of the most obvious reasons is to claim these castles. If you take control of any area that has a castle, you actually take that castle and add it to your player board. And if you're looking at my player board right now, you're kind of seeing that these castles take up spots on your income track. So you're kind of bumping that. You're limited by how many castles you can hold or how much gold you get by how many castles you have. You are required to have three castles to even have a shot at coming in here and taking King's Landing, which is kind of a useful goal. It can help yes. you. But you're also looking at your objectives on the bottom of your board. It's wanting you to control maybe some specific areas or control some areas that are adjacent to each other. This kind of does help inform your decision. And then, of course, you might want to fight your opponents either to 
decimate their army or to take control of areas they control or to hurt them in some way. But primarily, you're either taking the castles or you're trying to take these areas with coins printed on them because that's going to give you some additional income during the tax phase. But as you're moving around this board, you are potentially going to enter combat, which we'll talk about in a second, yeah. because combat is just one of the ways that you're going to use these multi-use cards that you have in your hand. Yeah, the other ways are kind of related to the other three actions here, and we'll go over those really quickly. The first one is Whisper. This one is uh, effectively allows you to get some income and reset your hand. You're able to discard any number of the plot cards. Now, this doesn't include your hero cards from your faction yeah. or any of the other houses, but you can discard any of the plot cards you have, get a gold back for each of those, and then refill up to your max of four plot cards in your hand. So this is a good way to refresh the cards, but also probably more often than not, a good way to get some income during the round. Yeah, and then the other two actions are how you're going to actually play the cards, either as a plot or as an action. And I'll talk about action first because that's pretty easy. Every card just has an ability at the bottom, and this ability, they're wide ranging. Some of them let you do some of these other actions, some of them get you income, some of them draw you cards, some of them attack your enemy or manipulate the board in some ways. There's just a ton of different things that can be done, but you have to take an action to play these cards for their ability. That's something you're gonna do fairly often, but another way that you're going to use these cards is for the plotting, and that's where the shields at the top of the card come into play. Yeah, and when you're taking the plot action, this is how you're interacting with these other houses in order to build those alliances. You're gonna take a card out of your hand and play it for the shields in the yeah. upper right hand corner. Building alliances, yeah, or taking hostages. It is Game of Thrones. I mean, that is effectively what you're, like you're forcing the alliance because you're, you're, you're taking their people. You can work it out thematically in your head however you want. But in the game, you're going to be looking at those shields and basically paying some money in order to take some of those power tokens into your ally pool. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I could do this and interact with these two houses. We have both of those out there, so I could pay one gold to take one here and put it into my ally pool if I want. And in the case of two shields, those let you pay twice and take one mm -hmm. from the other one if you want. Some of the cards just have one shield. This, this one is not in the game, but this shield would allow me to interact with that one house and get one on here. As soon as you get two, you will get an alliance, but not immediately, because that's done at the end of the round. Yeah, and it is two is the requirement, but it, the alliance can, if somebody sees you take two, they can go take three, and yes. they could actually win the alliance. In addition, whoever has the Iron Throne counts as kind of a wild that they can use to yeah. increase one of their alliances with their house. But these alliances are very important. When you get to the end of the round, meaning all four dice have been activated, of course, in a four-player game, that's one for each player, in a two-player game, that's why you have these two dice set aside, you activate those at the end and do those actions. But once you're done, there's a little uh, tax phase that you do where you can gain some income for the different things you've done during the game. But this is also where you check your alliances. Whoever has the most of an alliance gets to take that alliance token and place it besides them. This does quite a few things. For one, you get points during scoring for all your alliances, but also you immediately gain control of all of their troops wherever they are. And castles. Which means, yeah, if they're controlling a castle, you get that castle. This even could mean that you're taking an alliance from another player and now they're betraying that player by taking these. Now, the one thing here that I think is kind of neat, you can't just take a ton of troops of one and then lock down that alliance. At taxation, everybody has to discard down to two. So yeah. you end with the requirement. So next round, you, you have to keep working to keep your alliances or somebody can just easily come and take them away from you. Yeah, the alliances like Game of Thrones, very thematic, very, very touch and very go, tenuous. Yeah, very yeah. tenuous. Uh, and you might be asking yourself, what if you play one of your own shields or your opponent's shields? Well, that allows you to do some things too. If you play one of your own shields, that allows you to pay two gold to take any power token from any of the NPCs. And if you play one of your opponent's shields, you're able to take a power token from their ally pool directly into yours, which is a That's really a big, big that is very a big, swing. big swing. So all of that is kind of adjusted at the end of the round, but that is not the last thing that you can use with these multi-use cards. The third way you can use these multi-use cards is for the sword and shield symbol that's in the upper right corner. This is where you're going to be playing cards into combat. We mentioned earlier that combat can happen. There's no action to trigger combat. Combat happens when you move troops into another player's 
area. Uh, combat, again, it's kind of deterministic. There's no dice to roll for combat right. at all. You're simply looking at the total value of all of the troops you have in that battle. You're getting value from those power tokens. You're getting value from your leader figures. You're getting value from the castle if it's taking place in a place that you control the castle. And then lastly, you get some power from these cards. Now, if you're attacking, you get a little bit of an advantage because you get to play your attack card for free, but it's played face down. So your opponent doesn't exactly know, even though it is deterministic, they don't know exactly what your total is gonna be, but they can guess. The defender, however, has to pay gold to play their defense cards if there is a cost. So there is kind of a balance there of kind of watching and looking at your opponent's gold level and trying to attack them maybe when they're a little unprepared. Yeah. But again, you never know exactly what a, an opponent is going to have in their hand. So I don't think there's any sure thing when it comes to fighting a battle. Yeah, and each player gets to put just one card yeah. and contribute that to the battle. There are so also some interesting icons in the upper left-hand corner that aren't going to contribute to the value of your yeah, presence there. There's three icons that let you do things like retreat or maybe gain an extra power for adjacent domains yeah. where you have presence. So you can really take someone by surprise. There are some head games there when you place that card down. But like Ryan said, for the most part, you're going to be looking out on the board and determining a lot of the base values of how it's going to shake out. Yeah, and so that's pretty much what a turn looks like. You're doing those four actions, then you're moving on to the next round. You're rolling the dice again, you're resetting, and you're, you're taking those actions again. It's only after the third and fifth, and then again at the end of the game phases, that you actually score. And we talked about a lot of the things that you score already. Yeah. Whoever has the most castles controlled gets points. You get uh, points for having all of these different factions. And then you get points for your uh, objectives at the bottom of your board. To score these objectives, you have to have a certain number of troops recruited. As you take these troops off, you will get access to the objectives underneath them. You could score potentially up to five points if all of your troops are on the board and you manage to score all five objectives, which doing both of those things at once can be kind of difficult. But, you know, you've got a score track that goes only to like, you know, 30 points. So getting five points from one one go there is quite a bit of points. Yeah, this is not a very high scoring oh, yeah. game. This is going to be a game where you get a point here, a point there. I think when we played Ryan, I had a point where he got three points because he happened to have three of the four alliances yeah. at the end of the round. And that's quite a bit of points. Now, in a four-player game, the, the points scale, yes. especially the points for controlling the castles, because in a four-player game, you have a lot more contention exactly. over these castles than you do in a two-player game. But it's all going to remain pretty tight yeah. throughout the course mm -hmm. of the game. And again, it can be anyone's game. Someone can swing things pretty far by coming in and taking King's Landing from someone else. Yeah. That gives you some advantages, not only in battles there in King's Landing, but also with that token. Because when you have that token, it's effectively, like Ryan said earlier, a wild uh, yeah, house wild token. House, yeah. So if you have that plus any one other house token, you will have that alliance unless someone has three. Yeah, so like we said, this is a, a, a epic game in a tiny box. Expect yeah. the betrayals, expect the alliances to break, expect the, all the backstabbing and the secret uh, things that happen with the cards that you play. So there is, there's a lot that they packed into this small box. For yeah, sure. for sure. If you have any questions at all, please make them in the comments below. We'll get down there and answer whatever we can. Yeah. Until next time, make sure everyone has fun at the table and we'll see you then.